Hello, welcome back. Did you have a good break? Good. Well, your next speaker needs no introduction because it's me. <laughs> and I've already introduced myself. Um, hello. <gasps> So I am here today to talk to you about the future human's guide to leading change. So as I mentioned before, my name is Monica Parker and I'm founder of a company called Hatch. And Hatch is this human analytics and change consultancy and we're always looking at the future of work and what that means for people. But really we just want to make work life better. But it's actually an acronym. It stands for Human Analytics Think Connect Hatch. And that's what we do. We use all of this data that's running around in the world to help understand how people think how they collaborate, how they connect, how they innovate, and how they hatch new ideas. But it also comes from this quote, which is really something of a, a mantra for us hatchlings. That's what we call people who work for Hatch. You cannot go on indefinitely being an ordinary, decent egg. We must be hatched or go bad. The world is changing, in case you weren't aware, a lot of talk about that. And a lot of people are quite nervous about the level of change. They feel it's happening too quickly, that change is happening too fast. And what we like to focus on at Hatch and also myself personally is that I believe that change is miraculous, that change is exciting, and that it's really a get on or get out of the way. We cannot control it, but what we can do is see the metamorphosis that's inherent in change, that we can enjoy it, and that usually we either need to be hatched or go bad. I did mention to you a little bit about my background. I have a bit of a, a strange background, studied design, and then went on to do organizational behavior. And as I mentioned, I was a homicide investigator for the Department of Justice. I did not get to wear a cat suit. It is one of my great regrets in life. You know, get your mind out of the gutter. No, I never got to wear a cat suit. I did not carry a gun also, I'm okay with that. Um, but during that time, I had the opportunity to look at a side of the world that I had really never seen before. Again, newsflash, I am a white girl. I grew up in privilege in America. I did not know about prisons. I did not know about people who committed murder and the things that drove them to do that. But what I learned through this process is that the communities we surround ourselves with, the people we surround ourselves with and our environments have such a tremendous impact. And so when I left that work, and that work was pretty dark, I did have a client who was innocent who ended up being executed and was proven innocent posthumously. And that really sort of um, destroyed my, my connectivity to that work and I felt that I needed to move on. And when I did and started Hatch, I wanted to see how I could make the biggest impact. And we know that we spend more waking time with the people we work with and the places we work than almost anywhere else, right? And so when I wanted to look at work, I wanted to focus on more than just the physical. I wanted to look at the three spheres that intersect to create work and working. And so you can see here, you've got the physical, right? Work is the place that you go, and many of us will go to work, and it can be a lot of different places. We might go to an office or to a mega yacht um, or to a coffee shop, but lots of different places. And then of course, whether we want to be or not, almost every company is a technology company today, right? Everything runs on those gadgets and gizmos and the infrastructure that allows us to get our work done. But what gets me excited, what gets me out of bed is this idea of the people. And if it were up to me, that circle would be four times as big because that is what is most important. It's about the human element. And so everything that I'm going to talk to you for the next 20 minutes or so is about that lens, that lens of seeing everything through the position of a human, not as a data point not as an economic driver, not as a trend line, but just as humans. So, I have a question for you. We tend to be, as humans, either sort of a glass full or a glass empty, half full, half empty kind of people. Who of you believe that humanity's best days are ahead of us? By a show of hands. How many of you think that humanity's best days are behind us? So a few of you, um, you are in good, for those of you that believe that they're behind us, um, you are in good company. This was a question uh, posed to a group of Americans. In America, only 6% of Americans believe that humanity's best days 
are ahead of us. And you might say, well, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in America right now. Look at who their leadership is. Um, I'm not there anymore, there's a reason. But when they ask the same question to a, a country that is by all metrics one of the happiest countries in the world, Sweden, still 90% of people said that humanity's best days were before them. And so I think this is a really interesting question. If I were to put this series of points, if we were to look at these as metrics, would any of your opinions change? If you were to look at that and think life expectancy, health, poverty, not just a gut reaction, but if we were to start put metrics to this, would your opinion change? Do you still think that those of you that said humanity's best days are ahead of us still believe that? And those that said, no, they've passed. Any changes? Pretty much the same. This was a topic that was brought up during a series of monk debates. And the monk debates are um, a, a very erudite set of debates out of Canada. And they basically posit these, these large um, existential questions. And this was one of the questions that was put forward. And it was a really interesting group of folks that they had debate them. So on one side of the debate um, was Malcolm Gladwell and Alanda Baton. They were arguing that humanity's best days were behind us. And then on the flip side, saying that best days were ahead of us was um, Matt Ridley and um, Steven Pinker. And other than sustainability, so global warming, and nuclear proliferation, which you can't argue with, um, that was on uh, Malcolm Gladwell's side, Steven Pinker made some pretty compelling arguments. And he said that by all of these metrics, by every single one of these, humanity is in a better position. So life expectancy is longer, we're healthier, poverty has dropped, we have less war, less crime, more freedom, more education, more human rights. We live in a better planet. And yet it doesn't always feel that way. I'll just take two of these. So poverty as an example, right? Right now, only 10% of the planet lives in extreme poverty, and that's defined most recently by living on a dollar 90 or less a day. Now, 30 years ago, it was 30% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty, and they're saying that by 2030 it could be zero, but that doesn't really make headlines. War is another great example. There is no question that the wars happening in Yemen and Syria are heartbreaking. It literally, when I look at some of the pictures, it makes me sick to my stomach. But with the signing of the Columbia Peace Accord, we are now looking for the first time in, in history at a war-free Western Hemisphere. And so these are things that we tend to not really talk about, right? We see the really difficult, scary stuff, and we don't see the positive side. And there's a few reasons for that. You're saying, I know that you're telling me the world is better, but it doesn't, doesn't feel that way. It feels a lot like it's doom and gloom. The challenge is, is that there is a lot of momentum behind the negative message. So how many of you have ever heard that we live in a VUCA world? Have you heard this expression? A few of you. So VUCA means, and if you haven't, I encourage you to Google it, you can even Google it now, I won't be offended. But um, VUCA means that we live in a world that's more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And if you do Google it, you will find heaps of conferences and white papers and consultancies that will help you fix your VUCA problem. Now, it's interesting because this term was actually coined by the US Army War College. Now, I will not, I'll, I'm happy to get in a debate with you over a few cocktails about why the US Army might want a fear-based worldview to be perpetuated, right? But as soon as the US Army War College coined this term, all of the consultancies, the management consultancies, were happy to pick it up, right? And they were happy to say, yes, VUCA world. It's more complex, it's more ambiguous. You need to be worried. And what it starts to create is this negative cyclical momentum towards the idea that the world is a worse place. And our evolutionary elements of our brain doesn't help us. So I'm gonna to explain to you three reasons in the initial why we tend to see the world in a negative way, and then I'm gonna give you some examples of disruptors that we might see in the world that can be seen through a positive or a negative lens. So one of the key reasons why we see the world in a negative way, this. I have an app on my phone that plays the BBC News, right? And anybody who is from London probably knows that sound. Every time I hear that sound on my phone, I think, oh God, the world's ended. 
I'm gonna have to, I'm afraid to even look at what it is. There is an old journalistic adage that says, if it bleeds, it leads. Have you all heard this expression? It means that bad news travels faster than good. And the reason is, is because bad news tends to be sudden and singular, right? So there's a bombing in Sri Lanka, sudden and singular, that makes headlines. There's a terrible hurricane that hits uh, an area of the US, sudden and singular. But the positive things are slow and additive. And so things like the general reduction of poverty doesn't make headlines. The second reason that if it bleeds, it leads even works is because of the way that our brains over time have evolved. We have a note, we notice negative, things with a negative bias more quickly, basically to keep us safe, right? When we are out on the plains, making sure that we are not gonna get eaten by a woolly mammoth, I don't know if woolly mammoths are on planes, but um, that we weren't gonna get eaten by a woolly mammoth, we're looking for the negative things. And those negative biases actually act like little burrs, they stick in our brains and they stay there. And that's to help us stay safe, but we don't actually need that negative bias anymore, but our brains are still hardwired that way. And so the negative stuff stays in, and the positive Positive things tend to sort of just wash over. We don't hear them in the same way. And then the third element that feeds into these other two <clears throat> is this idea that's called motivated reasoning. So motivated reasoning is a psychological phenomena that says that our brains don't like cognitive dissonance. We don't like the things that are different that we hear from our strongly held beliefs. And so we will seek out, we have motivation to seek out those things that align with our reasoning. Now that used to not be such a problem because generally the truth, right, was the truth. And so you would seek out something that supported your way of thinking, but you would eventually get to the truth because that's where it was. But now, because of the wild and wacky world of the internet, pretty much any crazy idea that you have, there is some wingnut in the world that shares it with you and has put it on the internet. And so through this idea of motivated reasoning, we can just find more and more negative information and we feed on it. And we look for more and more because our brains are hungry for it. And so we tend to come at the world already with a slightly negative bias. And this is where this idea of disruption comes in. We tend to hear this word and think of it in a negative way. The term, I think, tends to be a little overused, but the genesis of it was a gentleman named Clayton Christensen. He coined the term in 1997, and he said it's a cultural phenomenon that undoes all previous assumptions. And I think if we look at disruption as that idea of undoes all previous assumptions, you can't argue with those, AI, globalization, mobile technology, and robotics. But it's a challenge because it tends to be seen, no one wants to be disrupted, right? You don't go, oh, hey, disrupt me, it's gonna be fun. No, it tends to be something you don't want to be disrupted. And so it's already seen as potentially a negative. But I wanna look at some of the ways that these disruptors can be th seen through both a positive and a negative lens. So the first is AI. Um, We've talked a little bit about AI and China. I'm going to talk about it again. Um, I've never seen the show Black Mirror, but I'm told that pretty much every freaky thing that can be done with AI you can see in, um, in that show. And as if straight out of an episode of Black Mirror, enter the Chinese social credit score. So the Chinese social credit score, if you're not familiar with it, basically is a score that is aggregated through all your activities for every Chinese citizen. Everything from whether you jaywalk to what cat memes you like on the internet, your surfing history, all of it. And this aggregates together to dole out your human rights. It's as simple as that. It determines what jobs you can apply for, what places you can travel to, where your kids can go to school, and people go, look, you know, it's a big country. This is how they're going to best be able to manage it. But they're using this in a pretty pernicious way. They're also using this facial recognition technology in order to identify people of a persecuted religious group called the Uyghur Muslims. So the Uyghur Muslims, if they travel more than 300 meters away from their home or the place of work, they're put in re-education camps to join a million other people currently that are living that way. 
A million people in internment camps. This is something that is not making the headlines, I don't think, nearly enough. I mean, that's, that's like Nazi Germany level. But they're using this technology in this way to manage their population and to basically deprive people of human rights. And so when I learned about the Indian government buying the exact same technology, I felt a little sick to my stomach and I thought, oh, what are they going to do with it? You know, not, not too great. But in fact, I'll tell you what they did with it. It could not be more different. It's an amazing story. They took this precise same technology, took all of the pictures of the children that were in every children's home and orphanage, matched it with their missing children database, 45,000 pictures, and they were able to reunite 3,000 missing children with their families in four days. Wow. So not a million, I know, incredible, right? So this is amazing technology, and it just goes to show you that it's not the technology that is the, the big, bad, evil sort of specter. It's what we choose to do with it. And it's one of the messages that I want to continue to deliver over this presentation is that we have the potential to embrace some of the most incredible transformations that are happening right now, but it all comes down to our intention. It all comes down to purpose. So the next is robotics. This is Boston Dynamics Spot Mini. I imagine most of you have seen this, or maybe you've seen this guy doing a dance to Uptown Funk, which is fun. So um, I get asked a lot, are robots gonna take my job? Yeah, they are. They are gonna take your job. They will probably become our robot overlords, but they will be polite. So that's good, right? They'll hold the door open. Um, I think that this freaks me out a little bit. The dexterity of these creatures freak me out, and I'm not alone. The studies show that people are disturbed by the dexterity of modern robots. And robotics is going to change the future of labor. The way that we approach our jobs, the way that um, our careers are going to be transformed by automation. So this is a statistic that I think every, every time I see it still sort of shocks me. A child today will have 17 jobs in five industries. This is a piece of research done by an Australian group called McCrindle. 17 jobs in five industries, not just the job for life is gone, the career for life, five industries. And a lot of these jobs, these changes, are not going to be voluntary. These are gonna be changes that happen because of automation. And these aren't just low-level jobs, PwC, did a piece of research, they found that two-thirds of jobs within PwC will become automated. These are high-level knowledge worker jobs. And it's not just that the job's gonna disappear, it's that a substantial portion of it will change, right? These same kids that are graduating from high school, 65% of the jobs they'll be in haven't even been invented yet. I mean, what, 30 years ago, we didn't have things like Stack Developer or, or Zumba Instructor, and now it exists all of a sudden. And so you just don't know what the future will hold. And it can be scary, but I think it can also be exciting. And so. That dynamic of what robotics and automation can do um, is a little daunting, but the opportunity is incredible. So I'm gonna play for you a little sound clip, and I wanna see if you recognize what it is. Anybody wanna guess? That is someone's brain. That is the inside of somebody's brain that is neurons firing. That is freaking cool. I mean, come on, I know I'm a nerd, but that's cool. Our ability to listen to someone's brain, to map their brain with MRI imaging, our understanding now of, of neuroscience is phenomenal. And when we connect neuroscience to robotics, the outcomes are truly stunning. So what you're looking at here is a gentleman called Juliano Pinto. He is a paraplegic, and he is kicking a football for the first time at the World Cup. How is he doing this? This isn't an exoskeleton that is moving his leg for him. This is a computer neural robotic interface. His brain is communicating to a piece of robotic equipment to kick his leg. That is miraculous. That is amazing. 
And so this is the kind of opportunity that we have. We look at those sort of robots that will take the jobs, but look at the opportunity that we can create when they start to connect with us. And in fact, Elon Musk says, and he's always you know, a ray of sunshine, but he says that basically humanity is going to destroy itself unless we become cyborgs, which I don't know that I necessarily quite go for that, but I do think it's gonna be less about the robot overlords and more about us partnering with um, machinery, and sometimes even machinery becoming a part of us. And I don't think that that necessarily has to be a negative thing. So the next disruptor is globalization. You have to accept that globalization is, is driving some really interesting choices globally, um, in particular around politics. There's no question that um, the election of Trump was a backlash to globalization. Many would say that the um, curious decision in the UK around Brexit was also a backlash to globalization. And so there is a real movement across Europe and a lot of other countries away from this idea of being connected. And yet, we've heard from a few presentations now, we cannot go back. We are global. We've created these connect levels of connectivity that cannot be undone. And one of the challenges is that it's creating a real issue around labor and movement of labor. So not all jobs are going away. Healthcare workers, people still want that done by a human being. And yet we're looking at an 18 million person shortfall of healthcare workers by 2030. And even today, many countries are dealing with shortfalls in healthcare workers because they can't get them to the places where they need to go because another backlash to globalization is tougher immigration laws. And so as countries like Norway, Japan are dealing with aging populations, not enough people to fill the jobs that they need to, this globalization and its backlash is gonna have to really be challenged, in particular around healthcare workers, but also around just the simple service employment that needs to get done. But I love this picture. Every time I see this, it just gives me a sense of awe. This, to me, is what globalization is and can be. This is a picture of the first zinnia grown in space. I mean, just saying that is cool, the first zinnia grown in space. This is taken by astronaut Scott Kelly, and I think it's such a beautiful metaphor for what globalization can create. This is on the International Space Station. This is incredible minds from all over the world coming together to create a better future. And that perfect blue orb of the planet Earth behind it, and that one flower that they've all nurtured together, that is globalization, people working together to create a better humanity. And I think that that's the opportunity. And then the last disruptor is mobile technology. Now, Paul already told you about how our attention spans are shorter than a goldfish, but you won't remember, because our attention spans are shorter than a goldfish, right? So our attention spans are now only about 14 seconds, or a goldfish is 14 seconds, our attention spans are somewhere around eight or nine seconds, and that is because of our digital consumption. Another element of how our brains are changing because digital consumption is that we no longer remember the things we take pictures of. And so with all of these selfies and all the photographs that we're able to take, there's been research that shows that when we take a photograph with our iPhone, our cell phone camera, we do not actually put that information, that memory, into our long-term memory. And it's damaging our ability to actually be present and to enjoy. Now, I thought it was interesting because the comment was made, well, it's not a mobile phone, it's just a phone. But actually, that's really just in the OECD because there are a lot of people in the developing world that have jumped right over analog into digital. And now, that mobile phone, the fact that it's mobile means everything because that's going to allow three billion people to enter the workforce in the next five years. The things that they're going to be able to do with that one piece of equipment will transform economies. And I think that that's really, really impactful to realize that we're in a little bit of a bubble in the OECD, right? In places like the UK and Norway and the EU, but there is a whole world that is just now on the precipice of being able to access education, uh, it, uh, uh, economic systems, commerce, in a way that they never were able to before. So whether you are a glass full or a glass empty person, whether you're just a glass of vodka person, either way, I know I'm looking forward to that. What it means is that we have a skills gap 
It means that there are things that we need to be learning now that we haven't yet. And people will say, okay, well, the skills gap is maybe coding, right? Everybody should learn to code. I will date myself. I never learned how to uh, program my VCR, right? But now it does it for me. Computers will be coding themselves in the next 10 years. I don't believe that those are the hard skills we need to be focusing on. I think what we need to be focusing on are the things that make us human, because those are the things that are not going to change. And this is where I maybe disagree a little bit with some of the research of Paul's, because I believe that at the end of the day, every generation, while there are elements that are changing, there are still pieces that will continue to make us primarily human. And those are presence, unlearning, aha, and Meraki. So unlearning, I love Yoda, my little origami Yoda. I try to put him in every presentation I can because Yoda, right? So what did Yoda say about unlearning? Yoda said you must unlearn what you have learned. And what did he mean by that? He meant that the things that we believe to be true with like a capital T may actually be getting in the way of our learning new things. And not surprisingly, um, neuroscientists agree with Yoda. So the godfather, the grandfather of, of neuroscience, a gentleman named Alvaro Pasqualione, he's from Harvard, says that in order for us to learn new things, we actually have to clear out the cranial real estate in order to do that. We can't just keep laying new ideas one on top of another. And this is really important because you go back to that slide about 17 jobs in five industries, those kids are gonna have to be learning and learning and learning new skills all the time, right? And so that means that they've gotta get really good at unlearning as well. And I think that that's a really critical, critical understanding of the way our brains work. I'm gonna show you a short little three minute video that I think does an incredible job of um, describing unlearning and it also is good for a good giggle, so. Like many six year olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it, but that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck, but at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. So that's over half his life. Are you gonna give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates 
that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult? And so that idea of neuroplasticity, I think, is really important. A little, a little practical tip, if you want to be able to leverage that, is that we tend to prune all of our neural connections as we go to sleep, right? So we build the ones that we use most of the time during the day, and then when we go to sleep, all of them get weaker. And so if there are particular things you want to learn, a language or a new way of doing something, then focus on it just before you go to bed and then right when you wake up in the morning. That's when your own brain is most plastic. So the next is aha. I think curiosity and embracing a sense of wonder is going to be so important. And the neuroscientists will tell us that they agree. They know that this is something that helps us be more positive and healthier. Did you know that curiosity actually changes the chemistry of your brain? That when we're curious about something, it triggers dopamine, it's like a drug. And then when we learn the actual answer, it triggers the hippocampus, which is the part of our brain that puts things into long-term learning. And so when you're curious about something, and then you learn the answer, or you, you remember it. So another little trick, of course, if you're trying to teach kids things, is you can show them things they're curious about, like Star Wars trivia, and then wedge that in with a little bit of, say, maths, and they'll remember it. Because their brains are very ripe, they're very curious. Einstein so revered curiosity, he called it holy curiosity. And if curiosity is sort of that itch that needs to be scratched, then awe is this incredible emotion that spans from the positive to the negative, right? Awful and awesome both have the same root word. Awe, by, according to scientists at UC Berkeley, is the single most pro-social emotion we can feel, right? This idea that brings us closer together, a deeper part of community, it actually even affects our, um, our health, our blood pressure, it makes us less susceptible to diabetes. And you might be saying, that's great, Monica, but I cannot just go out and sit on a mountain and you know, think om every day. But there are lots of quotidian ways we can tap into awe. And I would encourage you to do that. Think of business travel. I mean, that's a time I try to feel awe as much as I can. You're thinking, business travel? That's where you're cramped into tiny seats and eating little bags of pretzels and train, you know, planes are delayed. It's stressful. but. You're in a plane that's flying through the air. You're like a bird. That's amazing. And then you look out the window and you see this. This is the picture I took when we were landing here in Allison. That is incredible. That is awe-inspiring. And it makes a difference to our brains. It helps us be more resilient. And so try to find those opportunities to tap into awe. And it's something that we're doing a lot of research at Hatch now to understand how awe and wonder actually transforms ourselves physically and psychologically. The next is Meraki. And Meraki is actually a Greek word. It's a bit of, um, it doesn't have a direct translation. It's really a little bit passion, a little bit purpose with a sprinkling of grit. And I think that this is a really important word. If there was one hiring strategy I would have in the future, it's this idea of Meraki. Meraki and having a purpose-driven life is what creates a more ethical organization. There's been a lot of study around being more purpose-driven makes us have a greater sense of authenticity Greater authenticity means greater psychological safety. If you're not familiar with this idea of psychological safety, then I encourage you to look at Project Aristotle, which says that the single biggest indicator of innovation in teams, this is from Google, is psychological safety in an organization. So I'm just gonna tell you a quick story about this image. So those of you that aren't familiar, this is called the Art of the Brick. This is about a guy who is a Lego brick artist. His name is Nathan Sawaya. And he was actually trained to be a lawyer. And he went about his day lawyering every day, and at night he would do Lego brick art. He loved Lego brick art. And at one point he said, my purpose is to be a Lego brick artist, and I want to be a fly on the wall for that conversation with his friends and family. I am not going to be a lawyer anymore. I know I spent all this time doing this, but now I'm going to be a Lego brick artist. But that was his purpose. It was his Meraki, his passion. And by tapping into that, he said, I can make a bigger difference in the world. And I think that that's going to become more and more and more important in the future, is being really rooted to that purpose. One of my favorite quotes by Dan Pink, he says that when our purpose motive becomes unmoored from our profit motive, bad things happen. Look at VW and Uber and Theranos, profit motive and purpose motive unmoored. That is a problem. And I want us to see more connectivity to our purpose motive. 
And then the last is this idea of presence and empathy. Empathy is so important, and this is where I disagree with Paul. It will not be enough for us to connect using um, holograms. Why? Because our brains do not feel empathy to a machine. Our brains do not feel empathy looking at a screen. Empathy is actually generated by a set of mirror neurons in our brain. It actually allows us to reflect back what we see. And so if we see someone happy, we feel happy. If we see someone sad, we feel sad. You cannot feel that from an image. You feel that from another human being. And that's why that individual connectivity is going to be so important. But what is getting in the way between us and our empathy? Two things. One, our device culture, and the second is outgrouping. So how many of you all have iPhones? And how many have Android? So all of the Android people, you're super cool. iPhones, not so cool. That's just so say I. Simple as that, I've created two groups. I've created an in-group and an out-group. So the in-group says, Monica's cool, I like her, she's smart, she's on the stage, she knows what she's talking about. And all the iPhone people are like, who's this American woman coming to tell us that the phone we use isn't good? That's sim that means nothing to you what phone you use. And yet, you've already now identified whether you're in or you're out. And this matters. This is how we start to look at ourselves. And it's going back all the way to what Frederick said, right, at the beginning, that are we an iPhone user? Are we Norwegian? Are we a woman? Or are we a human being? And so the last little bit of information I'll share with you is a study that was done by a gentleman named David Eagleman. And he wanted to prove how difficult, how pernicious outgrouping was. And so he took people and he ran them through an MRI machine where he could look at their brains and he showed them a picture of a person having their hand stabbed by a needle. And their pain centers lit up almost as if they were being stabbed themselves, right? They felt empathy. It was, they felt like they were being injured. Then he made one change and he thought that there would be a difference but not the difference that they got. He labeled the hand. Atheist, Muslim, Christian. Now, when people saw that hand being stabbed, they felt nothing. Not a lower amount, but nothing. And so even atheists who presumably wouldn't assign these things felt nothing. And so it's understanding that that outgrouping makes a difference. It really affects the way that we connect with each other. And so if we want to start to be able to change the world, we have to see that we're all in this together. So my last slide, a little story. They looked at Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates and said, tell me what's going to happen to the future. Elon Musk said that basically AI was going to kill us all. Um, again, you know, we, we know that. He's not a cheery guy. And Stephen Hawking said that because we created AI, that actually we were the ones who could be in control of that and that it would be the greatest amplifier of human intention, either positive or negative. And when asked what one quality he'd want to amplify, he said, I would want to amplify empathy. And so that's the message I will leave with you, that I would hope you would go away and amplify empathy. So thank you guys very much, and I will head off.